Hello everyone, welcome to Atoms and Sporks, and in this most festive of times, I thought I'd do a little video to fit the season. Specifically, I want to talk about the amazing thermodynamic properties of snow and ice. And obviously I would have liked to have this video out a bit earlier, but as you can maybe tell from my voice, talking's been kind of hard for the last week and a half or so. But better late than never, so let's talk about this. Now, both of the properties I want to talk about today, as well as many other unusual properties of water we won't get into here, ultimately originate from the unusual molecular shape of good old H2O. In an H2O molecule, you've got an oxygen atom bonded to two hydrogen atoms, and due to some complexity of how the electrons are arranging themselves in this molecule, the whole thing is bent. This is different than, for example, something like carbon dioxide, which also has two atoms bonded to a central atom, but there's no bend. CO2 is called a linear molecule. So this bend in water molecules is unusual, and as we'll see, it is super important. Which, by the way, is kind of crazy to think about. The fact that this molecule has a little bend probably doesn't seem like particularly thrilling information. But as we will see, we owe this little bend our very existence. The reason for this is because at the regular atmospheric pressure of our planet, solid water, aka ice, forms a so-called hexagonal crystal structure, with these hexagons forming because of this bend. And what is noteworthy about this hexagonal structure is that, well, it's quite roomy. Now, roomy isn't exactly a technical term. The real word is that it has a very poor packing efficiency. But in a nutshell, in order to accommodate this bend in the molecule, the crystal structure of water is filled with a lot of unnecessary empty space. But this isn't just a bit of pointless trivia. Rather, as a result, the solid form of water is less dense than its liquid form. Or to put it another way, ice floats. And it's really kind of interesting to think about how our ape brains, which evolved on this planet which just has so much water, really don't appreciate the fact that liquids in general don't do that. The fact that we have icebergs and frozen over lakes would not happen if the surface of our planet was instead dominated by most other liquids. The normal way of things is that if I hold a liquid substance at a constant temperature and I just squeeze it, cranking up the pressure it's under more and more, it'll become a solid. For the vast majority of substances in the cosmos, that's how things are supposed to go. The consequences of this difference are literally life-changing. And that's because without this property, there is a very real chance that complex life on our planet would not even exist. To see why, it's first important to understand that ice is a very good thermal insulator. The reasons for this aren't maybe worth getting into here in great detail. It can get a bit complicated and there's actually some competing effects, but all that's really key to understand is that heat moves through it very slowly. This is why igloos and quincies are pretty functional. And yes, by the way, that may be the most Canadian thing I will ever say on this channel, so enjoy that. But what that really means is that the thicker ice gets, the slower the rate of freezing becomes. In other words, imagine I hold the surface of the water at some temperature below freezing. If ice didn't have this unusual property of becoming less dense as it froze, the new ice would sink, exposing new water to the surface to be frozen. As a result, the rate of ice formation would basically be constant, because at the freezing air-water interface, you'd continually have new water exposed as ice sank. However, because ice is less dense, as the air pulls heat out of the water, freezing it, it makes a layer of ice that floats on the top and acts like a thermal barrier because it conducts heat very poorly. So as I said, the thicker ice gets, the slower the rate at which heat can be pulled out of the water. The key real-world consequence of this is that when the temperature of the surface of our planet fluctuates, icing is a very slow process. Now, if on average the temperature of our planet was below the freezing point of water, this wouldn't matter so much and our oceans would still freeze and complex aquatic life would die. It'd just take a while for the initial freezing. However, the average temperature of our planet isn't freezing. It's something like 14 degrees Celsius above freezing. That means when winter comes and the temperature does get below freezing, the rate of ice formation is slow. One could even say glacial. And the total amount of ice that gets made by the time spring rolls around is a lot, lot less than if ice wasn't this way. 
On a planet where some other liquid was dominant, ice would sink and be lost forever to the depths of the ocean. It would become perma-ice, and the ocean floor would be solid. And whatever aquatic life could exist would live in a thin region of liquid between the icy depths and the surface. And more importantly, if it got cold, even just for a little bit, like, say, in winter, the entire thing may freeze. Of course, if the average temperature is above freezing, it'll all thaw again in the summer, but the damage would already be done. Complex aquatic life can't live in a big chunk of ice. And thus, every winter would potentially be a mass extinction, especially during unusually cold periods in the history of our planet, like ice ages. Though keep in mind that even during so-called ice ages, the average temperature of our planet was still above freezing. So, this amazing thermodynamic property of ice is that it's less dense than liquid water, and we owe that our lives. So, maybe next time when you're running late for work and you come out of your house and find that the snowplow yet again is blocked in your car with a huge bank of ice and snow, you should just take a second and go, Thanks, Ice. Thanks for being there. You're the best. Anyways, that was our first amazing property of ice. Now let's talk about a second one. It's unusual entropy. Now, up front, let me tell you that this isn't going to be a video where I talk about what exactly is entropy. There are plenty of videos out there already. I'm not going to talk about coin flips or shuffling cards. Rather, all I want to do is direct your attention to the third law of thermodynamics. It states that the entropy of a system approaches a constant value as its temperature approaches absolute zero. And what I want you to notice is this rather funny business of saying a constant value. To maybe highlight the oddness of things a bit more, consider a different way of phrasing the third law of thermodynamics. Entropy of a perfect crystal of a pure substance approaches zero as the temperature approaches absolute zero. The natural continuation of that formulation would then be something like grumble, 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 but for some systems, it doesn't go to zero. The key point being made is that as you approach absolute zero, for most systems, the entropy also tends to zero. But for some systems, this doesn't happen. Even at absolute zero, they still have so-called residual entropy that never goes away. So you can conceptually think of thermal entropy, which is sucked out of a system as you cool it, and then for some special systems, some residual entropy that you're just always stuck with. Well, guess what? Regular old everyday ice has an extremely high residual entropy. But why? Well, determining the residual entropy of something is actually really conceptually easy. The residual entropy is just related to the number of possible lowest energy states a system can have. What do I mean? Well, the lowest possible energy state a system can have is called its ground state. And for most systems, there's just one unique ground state. You know, there, there might be a certain crystal structure arrangement that all the atoms will coalesce into that is energetically the most favorable. And as you lower the temperature to absolute zero, they'll just curl up into that one state, snug as a bug. However, that's not the case with ice. Ice has a lot of ground states. How many ground states does it have? Well, how much ice you got? Ice has a ground state with so-called macroscopic degeneracy. Degeneracy, by the way, it's a physics word for when different states have the same identical properties like energy. So it's a physics word. I'm not like attacking ice's moral character. And by saying that ice is macroscopically degenerate, I mean that the number of degenerate states isn't just some number, like three or five, but rather it's proportional to the number of molecules of ice you have. With each new molecule, new degenerate states open up, increasing the total amount exponentially. But I haven't really answered the question, have I? Why does ice have so many ground states? Well, it's yet again because of this bend and this hexagonal structure ice forms. In this hexagonal solid structure, each oxygen molecule is connected to four other oxygen molecules by a little hydrogen that's just stuck in the middle. However, in H2O, an oxygen is only bonded to two hydrogen atoms. This leads to what are called the two-in, two-out, Bernal-Fowler ice rules. For any given oxygen atom in our ice crystal structure, it can pick two hydrogens to be its best friends and bond very strongly with them. And two hydrogens it has to keep at a distance. Those two are only loose acquaintances that, you know, when it sees them walking by on the sidewalk on the opposite side of the street, it quickly fumbles for its smartphone and starts playing with it so it can pretend that it simply wasn't paying attention and never noticed them. 
We can actually try and make a quick estimate of how many ground states that meet this two in two out requirement there are. Specifically for each oxygen atom, there are six ways this can be done. And the key point is that the energy of all these states is identical. The reason ICE has this residual entropy is because they're all equally good. Now you might then think that because each oxygen atom has six equally good options, then if I have two oxygen atoms, I have six times six, which is 36 ground states. And if I have three, I would have six times six times six and so on. Well, if only it was that easy. It's actually a harder problem than that because the oxygens can't actually choose their states independently of each other. Figuring out the right answer is actually a huge slog in the math of combinatorics and permutations. But the point is that the number of ground states grows with each new added water molecule. And as a result, even at absolute zero, ice is, in a sense, still somewhat disordered. That's residual entropy for you. It's an unusual property, most substances don't have any residual entropy, and ice has a lot of it. Historical footnote, by the way, one of the first people to recognize that ice had this property was Linus Pauling, one of only three people in history to win two Nobel Prizes, one for chemistry and one for peace. Pretty amazing stuff. Of course, in his later years, he made a bit of a, a hard turn into sort of quackery and started claiming that eating massive amounts of vitamin C was a cure for pretty much everything, including cancer. And then, you know, he actually, he died of cancer. He anyways, in this video, you hopefully learned a couple of amazing thermodynamic properties of ice. Namely, its unusual density, which is pretty damn important for life on Earth, and for its unusual entropy, which it holds on to even at absolute zero. Happy holidays, everyone. I hope to see you in the new year. I think I smell a glue vine with my name on it. Have a good one.